Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. As usual, I want to begin by reminding you that our friend and volunteer, Charlie Fabian, is awaiting word from you by email. If you have topics, suggestions, documents that might be of interest and use to us in formulating the segments that comprise this show. Here is Charlie's email, and he uh, is grateful, as we all are, for what you have been sending in, which far exceeds what we expected when we started this little small aspect of our project. Charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Once again, Charlie, spelled C-H-A-R-L-I-E, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Today's program is going to be talking about the economy of Germany and all that it means for Europe and therefore the world. Organizing success among low-paid workers in California. What the war in Ukraine has meant to the stock market versus what it has meant to you and me. And the mass movement of protest of European farmers. We don't give enough attention to agricultural work and work conditions, neither in this country nor in many others. So this was a chance to make up for that deficit by talking about a remarkable movement across the continent of Europe, led and mobilized by the farmers in those countries. And in our second half, we will continue what we began last week, which is a survey of some of the more egregious, unjust, unfair aspects of the tax code of the United States, now that we are heading into the annual tax-paying season. Okay, let's start. Germany. Germany was, for most of the last 20 years, the powerhouse economy of Europe, the largest single economy, the one growing the quickest, the one with a global footprint far beyond that achieved by most of the other European countries. But now the situation has changed dramatically. Germany is affected by a remarkable label, quote, the sick man of Europe, end quote. Why? Because the engine of economic growth in Europe, Germany, is not moving along. Germany is, if not in recession right now, so close that it is something that the German people can taste and are reacting to as the politics of that country goes through a major shakeup, reminding many people of what they observe here in the United States over the last seven or eight years. Here are some of the signs and the reasons why Germany is having such a hard time and why Europe, therefore, is having one too. First, not only is there no growth in Germany, but they are busily losing their markets. They are busily losing their very industries. The most popular word in headlines in economic news in Germany these days is the word deindustrialization, the opposite of industrialization. It's when you're not growing new or expanding factories and manufacturing, it's when you're doing the opposite, shutting them down, not replacing them, shrinking them. And why? First and foremost, the war in Ukraine. And how does that work? Well, the economic strategy led by the United States, with which Germany has cooperated, has been to levy sanctions on Russia, the biggest one of which was not buying oil and gas from Russia the way it had been purchased before. Let me be clear. One of the reasons Germany was the success of the last 20 years 
was that it had the best access of all of Europe to cheap oil and gas from Russia. That enabled the Germans to outcompete the French or the British or the Italians. Yes, I know we all hear the stories about the Germans are great technical workers and efficient and engineering types. There's a little of that, but this was the much more important. They had cheap energy, cheaper than what the French had to pay to get energy from North Africa or the British from around the world, et cetera, et cetera. And they lost that to go along with the United States to fight Russia through Ukraine. They had to go from cheap energy to very high cost energy. Instead of cheap Russian oil and gas, they had to buy liquefied natural gas from the United States at a much, much, much higher price. And that meant that they had to charge more for what they produced in Germany. And that meant that the people around the world didn't buy German goods the way they once did because they were now too expensive since the Germans had to pay more for energy. So they shifted to other countries. And that hurt the German economy badly. Then there was the global inflation, partly because energy prices went up, prices across the board went up in Germany and in Europe. And what did the German central bank do? The same thing that Federal Reserve did, raise interest rates. Was that the only way to deal with an inflation? No, we made that point on this program repeatedly, but that's the one they chose. And if interest rates went up, that meant another cost of doing business for German industry went way up. Not just energy, but loans, cash, access to credit was still not done. The German population had gotten a tremendous boost with the unification of Western East Germany when trained, educated, highly skilled Eastern German workers were brought in to the larger unified German working class. Now that they're used up, the Germans are discovering they're not producing babies the, ones they, the way they once did. So you know what they did? They brought in waves of immigrants. Angela Merkel opened Germany to immigrants, not just from Turkey and the Middle East, but North Africa and all over. And you know what that did? Terrified the German working class that they were going to be replaced by immigrants. Should sound familiar, because we have very similar things in the United States. And that disrupted German politics as the left wing of the working class moved over to the right wing because they saw a more urgent threat in those immigrants than they did in the slow but scary decline of German capitalism. Put all those things together, Germany's got big problems. They can't continue immigration. Their working class won't allow it. They can't solve their labor shortage that way. Meanwhile, they have high interest rates and they have a high energy costs. And so the engine of Europe sputters and goes down. It's going to make big changes in Europe. And that's why it's important for me to alert you to what's going on. The next update is simply a, a hats off. There's a new organization called the California Fast Food Workers Union. It's been an attempt, successful now, led by workers, particularly black and brown Americans, working in the fast food industry, and particularly in McDonald's, Pizza Hut, and a West Coast chain called Jack in the Box. They've been very successful. They've been working with SEIU, Service Employees International Union, part of the AFL-CIO, and they formed this new cross-company alliance of fast food workers. This April, they begin to enjoy their first victory, $20 an hour minimum wage across all fast food outlets represented by this union. They get guaranteed minimum hours so they can earn a decent living. You can't fire workers anymore unless you have a just cause 
and that's spelled out. And there can't be retaliation for workers who unionize. That is the law in the United States. You cannot be fired for union activities, but they do it anyway, don't you know? But they won't be doing it in those restaurants because they just signed off on it, and now there will be legal penalties. And there are more. This is an important step forward for unions in general, but for unions of low-income workers, service workers, where there's a lot of turnover, which were thought to be ununionizable. Guess what? Unions can be organized where there's a will. There's a way. And the unions are proving it. Then I wanted to give you a simple statistic as the third update for today. I thought I'd do an experiment. How has the stock market done from February of 2022, the beginning of the war in Ukraine when Russia invades Ukraine, right up till the present, February 2024, two years, roughly. Over those two years, I want you to see how the stock market has done and compared to how you have done, you, my listener, my viewer. The 500 largest U.S. companies are gathered in an index called the Standard and Poor 500, S&P 500. The S&P 500 is up from February of 2022 to February of 2024, 40%. So if you owned a reasonably random smattering of the 500 largest corporations, you'd be sitting pretty. Whatever you had in 2022, two years later, is worth 40% more. And you, and you, and you, have you done 40% better? Are your assets 40% greater? Is your bank account 40% larger? No, I didn't think so. The war is good for some, but not for others. Most of the rest of us have seen an inflation, which, if anything, has wiped out the value of whatever assets we had, made it harder to make ends meet. No, nah, the war in Ukraine hadn't brought us any benefits, but it has brought benefits to your average shareholder. Remember, the 10% richest Americans own 80% of the shares. Somebody is benefiting from the war. It's just not you and me. And finally, the farmers. Across Europe, the farmers are moving. They're putting their tractors on the roads so the highways can't budge. They're clogging the city. They're b blocking the entry of trucks into and out of Berlin, and Madrid, and Paris, and London. What's going on? The farmers are angry, and there are two lessons here. They're angry that their livings are being destroyed. When the price of energy went up, they had to pay more for the fertilizer they bought because it's made with energy. They had to pay more to run their tractors, run by energy. Meanwhile, the government, to placate the mass of people who were freaking out about food prices, kept them from going up often in a whole manner of ways. That squeezes the farmer, has to sell their product at the same or a lower price, but has much greater costs. The farmers won't have it, and they marched, and they're making their... No anger felt. And you know what the politicians are doing? They have to do something for fear of losing the farmer's support. You know what they're doing? They're using taxes to give little benefits to the farmers. And you know what else they're doing? They're relaxing environmental safety to allow toxic chemicals back into the food. Are they taxing the rich to solve this problem? Not a, not a whisper. No, no, they're going to attack nature and our ecological survival to help these farmers. That's incompetent politics or worse. We've come to the end of the first half of today's show. Please stay with us. We'll come right back with our analysis of tax injustice from the federal level right now. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. We're going to continue what we did the second half of last week's program 
which is take a look at the federal tax structure of the United States with particular emphasis on a selection of the most unfair, unjust elements. Look, I could take several entire programs going through all of them. I'm just picking a few to give you an idea of how, over time, the influence of corporations and the rich have produced a weird tax system. That's why it's a big fat book each time they issue the tax rules for the next year, because so many special arrangements have been made to save money over here for these rich people, to save money over there for these industrial interests, and so on. So the end result is this weird concoction, and I am selecting items for you to think about that you might not have thought about before. So the first one I want to talk to you about today are exemptions. That's right. Written into the tax code, there are specific exemptions, categories of people who are allowed to earn an income without paying any tax on it at all. Let me say that again. An income you earn by working, by investing, you'll see I'm going to go through it. But unlike others, you don't have to pay any income tax on it at all. Or you pay, pay, uh, pay excuse me, a very small rate, much, much, much lower than anybody else. And I'm going to begin where you might be surprised I will begin with a private university. I'm going to pick one that I went to school at, just so you don't think I'm picking favorites. Yale University, located in New Haven, Connecticut. Yale University is one of the oldest universities in the United States. It goes way back to colonial times, when New Haven was a colonial outpost of the British Empire. And it was decided that because the people who settled there went to war against the local indigenous population, killing them in large numbers, making room for themselves, that these were deeply religious people. In this case, Protestant religious people, Christians. And they wanted to not only settle the land and remove the indigenous people, but they also wanted to build churches where there would be pastors, ministers, producing the religious activities they wished to engage in. The problem was they didn't have much money. And so they got together and they said, well, a bunch of us are farmers here in New England, in Connecticut, where New Haven is located and where Yale exists. We're farmers and we can pay a tax on the farming that we do, and we're craftspeople, and we're small merchants, and we are what we were in the colonial days of the United States in New England, and we can afford to pay taxes because we do things that make money, but churches don't. They just don't, and if the churches had to pay the same taxes that we all pay, a tax on our land the farmer had to pay, a tax on, our, on animals, a tax on the income they earned, if and when that was a tax that was levied. When that, all that was done, the decision was made by the local Christian settlers that they would give Yale University a tax exemption. Ah, and why? They were very clear. It's in the Constitution of Connecticut. The exemption was there because Yale would train young men to become ministers. And in order that there be ministers, because they couldn't imagine the church without them, they had to be trained. And in order for them to be trained, there had to be an institution that did it, and it couldn't survive if it had to pay taxes. 
So they gave Yale, a Connecticut institution, a tax exemption in Connecticut because it produced ministers for the people in Connecticut. Kind of logical if you think about it. Well, that got generalized. You'll never be surprised to learn that the people who got a tax exemption fought very hard in the intervening three centuries not to lose it. So by now, the federal tax code, not just Connecticut, but in all 50 states plus the federal government, they exempt educational, religious, and often medical and charitable institutions from paying taxes. Yale is now a multi-billion dollar profitable corporation, but it still pays no taxes on its property or a very recently, a very small amount, much lower than it would have to if it were taxed like everybody else. Now it's become a rich people's exemption. And we're all supposed to pretend not to notice that that was never the intention when it started and it shouldn't be there now. The richest people on earth send their children to Yale University. They can pay. Wow. And then for those of you that are not religious, let me make sure you understand. Every church, every synagogue, every mosque, every religious institution in this country can and typically does apply for an exemption, which means if they earn money, they don't have to pay tax on it. Yale owns, for example, like many churches do, Stocks and bonds given to them by parishioners, given to them by alumni. They hold these stocks and bonds. They earn dividends. They earn interest on them. And on that income, they pay, you got it, no income tax or a very, very, very small amount recently enacted. The churches are subsidized. It means that the local church can use the services of the local cops, the local firefighters, the local folks who clean the air, the local people who teach everyone in the classroom of the elementary school or the high school. All the churches get all the benefits of all the public services, but they don't pay for them. You and I do. On our house, we pay a property tax. On our wages, we pay an income tax. On our stocks and bonds, we, should we be so lucky, we pay taxes on the dividend income, the interest income, the capital gains. Oh, yeah, we pay. They don't. Because they're a church. You may not understand it, but you, the American people, subsidize all religious institutions. Here's a question for you to ponder in the quiet moments of your day. If the United States government, plus the 50 states, plus all the cities and towns, actually made churches and synagogues and mosques pay the same rate of taxation other local institutions do, like the stores, like the homes, like the cars, like the businesses, and so on, how many people would go to church? How many churches would survive if they had to pay taxes? They're all subsidized. They None of them pay for what they get. When you hear some conservative tell you, I want these people uh, to pay for what they get, remember that's the same person who's protecting the churches by never bringing up the fact that we require the American people through their taxes to subsidize all of those institutions Yale, Harvard, the church, the mosque, the synagogue. They're all subsidized. We subsidize religion in this country, and we always have. The next item, again, I could spend an hour on it. We used to believe in something called the level playing field, that every child born into this world should have an equal opportunity to develop their skills, their capacities, 
their passions, their knowledge, and go out there and contribute to the community and be accordingly rewarded. But of course, if you believe in a level playing field, you can't allow one baby born into this world to have a million dollars available and another one have nothing. Because the one with the million will get the better education, skill training, habits, medical care, personal care. You know the story. You don't really need me. So either you believe in a level playing field or you don't. Either you want people who are already rich to have an advantage over those who aren't, so that inherited wealth becomes the norm, so that rich people can make sure their kids are rich, whereas people who aren't rich will have that much harder getting their kids into that class of folks. I mean, either you understand this or you don't. When I was young, only the first one or two hundred thousand dollars that you could leave to a descendant, your children, was free of taxation by the federal government. Today, a husband and wife, right now in the United States, can leave to their children twenty-two million dollars tax-free. No inheritance tax, no estate tax on the first 22 million bucks. You only have to start paying a tax on what you leave to your kids above that. The first 22 million. Well, you know what that means? That means that almost nobody pays estate tax in the United States. Because between the 22 million, you can legally leave without taxes. And all the gimmicks that I will explain on another occasion that allow you to move money without becoming considered an estate you have to pay tax on. You put these two together and the rich stay rich and the families become perpetual. We have a perpetual rich class in the United States, not because that's natural, it never was. It's because those rich people have made the law written this way to help them do that. And you can't do that. And so you haven't been able to. And though you just suffer. Because remember, what they don't pay in taxes, you do. Government still has to spend the money, still has to fight the wars, still has to keep the roads. So if you don't pay because you're rich enough to get out of it, somebody else will to name it again. And now we come to the last one, and I'll just begin here, and we'll continue this next week, just to keep it going. Social Security. What a boondoggle that is. Social Security, for those of you who don't know, money taken out of your wages, half out of your wage, half the employer matches. Now, it could be a low rate for people who earn 10 or 20 or 30,000 and a much higher one for people who earn millions. That would be a progressive rate. That's how we organize the income tax. But we didn't do that for the Social Security because rich people didn't want it. So it's a flat tax. Everybody pays the same. Very bad for those at the bottom who pay the same rate as those at the top. Good for those at the top, not for the bottom. As you will see when we go through it, that's the same story across the board. A system rigged, as Bernie might say, in favor of one and against another. We've come to the end of today's show. Please remember, we are a continuing operation. Stay with us. And as always, I look forward to speaking with you again next week.